that's wash number one. It's dry. It's got to be dry before you start wash number two or you get all kinds of problems. One of the best things that you can do for yourself is to have a system. And Tim Oliver, what are you going to talk about today? I'm going to show you how to paint more si uh, simple, intuitive, and repeatable. What I'm going to be talking about is, is specific to watercolorists, for watercolorists. But we all know that, um, and Eric, you can probably confirm this, but every oil painter or, or acrylic painter out there secretly desires to be a watercolorist. So this will be... Is uh, that true? Yeah. Well, I well, think I, so. I will... I will tell you this, ever since Watercolor Live, I've been playing with watercolor a lot more, and uh, it's already, the things, that, the lessons that I learned on watching that are already starting to really sink in, and uh, I, I've had some really knock them out of the park watercolors, so I'm really anxious to hear this, and of course, a lot of us, whether we're oil, pastel, or otherwise, a lot of us do watercolor anyway, because especially yeah. on those moments when we, you know, we have our sketchbook and some watercolors and nothing else. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm, I'm only joking about that. Uh, I secretly uh, uh, desire to, to be accomplished in oils, but I don't have time. So um, I, I've got so much to learn about watercolor, but to, to get real quick, and I know our time is limited. So I, I want to real quickly, <clears throat> show you i had one of those light bulb moments probably 15 years ago i struggled with watercolor i struggled and i fought it and you know and it was it would i would get in the middle of a painting and i would start to panic you know it would it would be like the like the proverbial third monkey trying to get on noah's ark in the rain you know and i couldn't get i couldn't get uh a system in place and so with the help of some really accomplished watercolorists that i studied with I, I, I learned a, a process and it just, it was, a, it was, a, it was one of those light bulb moments. It's like, Oh, I think I can do that. I think that's simple. Can you see that? I think it's simple. It, it, it's becoming intuitive and it's repeatable and, and I can do that every time. And, and so, um, so, so it was, it was, it was the, the beginning of a huge change in my work. So, so I, I, I call this the, successive wash layering process so we're gonna we're gonna put at, after all the preliminary work is done for a painting the 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 um um the the composition the you've identified a scene or a subject matter and, and you've uh, you've worked through through the process of coming up with a with a, a, a composition you've worked on your values we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to apply paint and so that's what i want to show is 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 the way that I apply paint, and just for those watching, look at these these three things. We're going to apply our paint top to bottom. Now, let me let me back up just real quickly. Extremely accomplished watercolors don't necessarily paint this way. So every for every uh, system that anybody comes up with or a process that anybody comes up with, there are exceptions. There are incredible watercolors that that do that different. This works for me. This is specific to me. I paint from top to bottom generally, which means I'm going to be at the top of the paper on a slope and painting from the top to the bottom. I'm going to go from light to dark, light pigment, light values to dark values, which is typical with watercolor as, a, as opposed to oils or acrylics. And then I'm going to paint thin to thick. So my paint is going to, as I continually build this painting up my pigment my my paint is going to get thicker so and less watery so anyway that's that all right that's very helpful do you always tape your watercolor paper down i do i, I do I, I, i'm just a, i'm a tape guy yeah i, like I, I wonder because one one of the things i realized is i'm getting a lot of curling and yeah. it's because I'm not taping down. Now, the other thing is people are asking or will ask, uh, tell us what kind of paper you're working on and uh, what kind of paint you're using. I use Saunders Waterford rough paper, 140 pound rough. And I use Daniel Smith's paint uh, uh, pigments. 99.9% uh, .9 of my pigments are Daniel Smith. I just like their range and, and everything about them. And uh, I try to keep it simple. 
because uh, things can get so complicated so fast. Uh, I like to have one one manufacturer of paint. Uh, anyway, that's what I use. So, and what do you draw in with? Is that a graphite pencil? What is it? Yeah, that's a that's. I just use a HB kind of a soft leaded uh, 0.7 pencil most of the time. Most of the time. Now I've drawn this a little darker than I would normally do it, uh, just because I want people to be able to see it uh, better All for right. the demo. Yeah. But I don't worry about pencil lines. People get worried about pencil lines. I don't worry about pencil. By the time I've finished painting, 90% of these pencil lines, even these dark ones, will kind of disappear. And if I want to, I just I can I can pull out a little kneaded eraser and erase a few if I need to. But I like the I like people to be able to see my my preliminary thought process. You know, I think I know when I see a watercolor and I see some pencil lines in there, I'm thinking I'm trying to get in the artist's head. What was he thinking? I can see what he did there, you know, and and it's and it's kind of exciting to see pencil lines left over. I'm not a purist and I, I paint in a little bit of a uh, I call it a sloppy uh manner anyway it's just the way i the way i paint but so i don't mind that so much but um let's just get, let's get into it because i know we don't have much time last fall i took a trip i'm a high plains of west texas guy and i love the plains and so i took a trip on highway 83 highway 83 goes all the way from brownsville texas way at the tip of texas all the way to the canadian border continuous and uh, so I took about two weeks, nearly two weeks, and I uh, Highway 83 crosses pretty close to where I live in in, tech, in, in the Panhandle. And so I, ju I jumped on Highway 83 and went north. And I painted my way north. I had a little camper that I took, and it was just me. I, I drove, and I stopped when I wanted to stop, painted what I wanted to paint. But it was a great trip. But grain elevators, as you can imagine, all the way up through Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, everywhere and so this was a this was in north dakota this was seen in north dakota a grain elevator that i painted i uh, i didn't paint it there i didn't i didn't have enough time but i, I did this sketch uh on location so i i worked out my painting uh, in this sketch and uh and then i've painted it once as a demo since then i'm gonna do a bigger painting but i thought i would use that Use that. I've just transferred that sketch, redrew it here on the watercolor paper. And so this is what I'll do. I'm thinking All right, about there's a question in the comments, yeah. Tim, about uh, whether or not the the uh, graphite, when it gets wet, impacts the colors. Not really. Not really. It'll melt somewhat. Um, it melts a little bit, but not much. It mainly just gets covered up, erased, whatever. But right. but uh, no, it doesn't. Um, um if it was really soft lead and really thickly applied, possibly, you know, charcoal will melt. If you use charcoal, it'll melt into the watercolor and kind of change the value of the pigment. So, but that's, you just go with the flow on that too. So, um, so what I'm going to do, if you remember, if you remember the top to bottom, I'm going to paint top to bottom. Why don't you, uh, why don't you put your little cheat sheet back on screen for a second? Because there are people who just joined, our guest today is Tim Oliver. He's going to teach you a watercolor system to make it simple, intuitive, and repeatable. So would you explain this again one more time? Yeah, I sure will. I'm, uh, generally speaking, and what I'm going to demonstrate today is painting from the top to the bottom. In other words, the top of the, the, the image down to the bottom. And I'm going to go from light pig, lighter pigment to darker pigment on the successive layers. I'm going to let, let the layers dry in between. Uh, and then I'm going, as I progress through the layering, I'm going to go from thin to thicker paper. Top to bottom, light to dark, thin to thick. If, if you're a watercolor, you just need to have that drilled into your, into your uh, brain. Well, that's hard for me as an oil guy because I typically start out with my darks. Yeah. It's yeah. the opposite. It's total opposite. And I know a lot of times oil painters will start at kind of the 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 – center of interest and work their way out everybody's got their own way but but uh but it, it, this, this is a kind of a baseline yeah, and, and i i change things up now a little bit from time to time depending on what i need to accomplish but as a general rule this can be a light bulb moment for you if, if you'll do that and when i teach in workshops i teach this and then 
and then students will immediately go back to doing their other way of doing things. You know, they'll be they'll be painting here and, and there, and and it, it 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 if they'll just do this, it'll help. And then they can modify it. It's like everything that we learn to do. If we if when we get good at it, we can modify it. So, um, so this is the, this is the painting. I've already done through the work of of establishing this composition and the values. I've darkened some things. Because as you, when you get part started painting, you, you can get lost if you're not careful with with a, with a, with watercolor, especially because you got to get the you got to get that first wash right. It's real important. So what I've identified with this is is I identified for everybody where I'm going to preserve the white paper. So oh, what a great idea! Yeah, my light source is coming this way. I'm going to preserve some white. I'm going to paint around. You'll see when I demonstrate this what I mean by this, but I, I'm going to remind myself that I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to preserve some white in these locations because they'll be really important as I finish the painting that, that, that white is going to be really important. So Tim, some people use a resist uh, where they yeah. just put, they put a little color on the resist and put it down yeah. and peel it off. Why don't you right. do that? Um, I did, I tried that. And for me, it was just, it was just a hassle, you know, it was just, I didn't, I didn't like putting it down. I didn't like peeling it up. I didn't like the hard edges. Sometimes it leaves some really hard, well, it always leaves really hard edges. And then you got to figure out how to lose some of those edges and fuzz some things out. So I just decided I'm going to, I'm a painter. I'm going to learn to paint around things, you know? Okay. And, and so that's what I do. So anyway, Planning is so important. People want to paint without any planning that goes in before. But man, to have a successful painting, uh, I've, I've I've done some bomb paintings, and the ones that bombed are the ones I didn't spend any time in the preliminary stages doing that. So okay. anyway, that that is that, and uh, and back to this. That's the scene, and and I could talk too much, but. You can see I've modified this painting uh, from this scene. This is somewhat of an interesting shape. The shapes are great. Uh, architecturally, it's a little blah, you know. So I'm I'm making a painting out of a out of a uh, out of a, a a scene that needs some help. So you can, right. see, uh, and that's what we do as painters. So let's let's get started. I'm, I'm gonna. I don't know if you can see my palette. I know when I'm watching somebody demo, I love to see their palette. Uh, I no, like maybe it. if you turn it uh, counterclockwise a little bit. Oh, well, I, I could see your mixing area, but I can't see your colors. I can move it over a little. Yeah, that if you move, actually, your camera could go over to the right just a little bit because we're we're seeing a lot of edge of your paint. No, the uh, the other right. <laughs> there we go, right there. Stop. Okay, good. Is that all right? Yep. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I, I think so. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. This is what. This is our first pass. This is this is our first wash, and uh, it it's, it's going to establish the the mood or the tone of the whole painting. So it's really important. So I'm going to assume you have this, not wet your paper. Is that correct? That's right. I don't uh, generally pre-wet my paper. Uh, because I, I, I don't know why I just never really gotten into that habit. Um, right. So I'm just using a little ultramarine blue and I'm throwing a little bit of cerulean blue in there. And I'm going to just assume this is a clear blue sky kind of a day. And so this is a pretty w wet wash. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm using a mop with it'll carry a lot of water. And your your canvas or your paper is at a forty five degree angle. Yeah, about thirty degree angle. Yeah. I'm gonna use a lot of water. You can see that bead forming right there, all along there. Yep. That's really important. Why? So that's about all the pigment. I might add a little more cerulean into that because that'll that will uh, that's a truer blue sky. But this is a real wet kind of a wash, and it it really sort of starts to paint itself. Now, if you remember, I was going to paint around that, that white there. 
and the white there. Yeah. White there, white there, white there, and white there. So, so I'm just going to paint around that. Otherwise, I'm not too concerned about any of this. My whole goal is to get this wash flowing down the page. And, let, and waiting on it a little bit. So I can add a little color in there. I can, I can, I can reinvigorate uh, that bead if it starts to dry up a little bit. Now I'm I'm diluting my paint now because I'm 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 wanting to. Um, if you'll notice, I'm not worried about painting over this building because I know the the successive wash is going to be darker. But so you're, it, you're using your blue for your shadows. Yeah, kind of, kind of, um, kind of. Um, I'm just not. I'm just really not worrying about painting through any of this because um, because the the next the next um, layer is going to be a little bit darker than that, so it's going to cover that layer up. Okay. So I can add. I can go back in there as long as it's a little bit wet. I can add. I can I can do anything to that while it's wet without having blooms. Uh, I could have clouds in there. I just wanted to keep it simple. So basically now I'm just painting with water and I'm gonna paint through everything. And let it let it kind of keep flowing down. But you're not gonna paint through your whites. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that 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 and this whole area here is gonna be uh, uh, unpainted. And that just helps me that just helps me uh, helps me kind of visualize what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, as I get closer to the to the uh, horizon line, I'm going to add a little warmth to that, a little ground effect. See how that that changes just a little bit, and then I'm going to go ahead and bring that right back to the horizon. And if I want to, at that point, I can, uh, I'm going to stop my wash right there because I also want uh, the great watercolors and great friend and, and mentor uh, Ian Stewart uh, coined this term, this uh, along the horizon, he calls it a kiss line. So, um, so I, I love leaving a little, little thread of broken white along the horizon. Uh, it, it, it's 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 just a one of those cool factors. All right. Um, plus, it, it it helps. What I might do is, while I'm at it, I'm going to add a little bit of alizarin to that blue. Maybe a little more. Give it a little bit of a purple, and and, and watch this. Just. Not now you got a mountain. Yeah, or a, or a thunderstorm building in the far uh, in the far. Uh, just a hint of some atmosphere happening back there. Nice. Okay. If you're tuning in, uh, our guest today is Tim Oliver, who's teaching a watercolor system, and it's going to be he's painting top to bottom, and then light to dark, and then thin to thick. If you guys are uh, enjoying this, make sure to hit the share or the like button. Uh, make sure other people can see it. That's always helpful. And tell us in the comments where you're from today. You have a chance to win a pair of value specs uh, that will help you see values. It's a little gimmicky, but it works really well. So, Hello, Ireland. Nice to see you here today. Okay, so I'm just... I'm just now in this wash. I'm just, I'm just adding some. You can do just, you can do just about anything. Um, as that, uh, as that, uh, as that sort of 
knowing the, the, the moisture level of the paper is really important. Sometimes you have to test it, but it's a little wet still there. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, all of this sort of starts to. So do you need, a, do you need a drying paint. moment? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think, if, I think at this point I better just, uh, all right. uh, let it dry. I would, I would babysit it and tend it a little bit, uh, normally, but I, I might go ahead and dry it if, if you, if you, and, uh, one of the things I was going to do, uh, a, a little bit was just, is just add some little, uh, add some far distant trees out there along the horizon that just gives you an idea that the horizon is out there and i'm, I'm doing this very kind of fast and and uh and and loose so i apologize about that but no, it looks uh, great see how that gives you a little sense of distance of, of distance i can blot those back a little bit if i want to and that just that just increases that distance in the paint so can you still see my palette? Yes, sir. Okay, so I've got ultramarine blue here, and I've got um, transparent red oxide here, which is basically burnt sienna. It's Daniel Smith's version of Windsor Newton burnt sienna, transparent red oxide. So we all know as painters that when you add ultramarine blue to burnt sienna, you get a beautiful range of neutrals, right? So, yeah. so so I, I can, or graze. So I can, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to add a little blue, maybe pick up a little bit of that. And I, I end up with some really cool. Look at that. Look at that gray there. All right. That's so, a good trick. Keeping a little piece of paper there to test your color before you put it on your paint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will kind of test it, you know, on there. Uh, and I, I've just never gotten in that habit. Um, but, um, uh, um, so that's wash number one. And there's a lot of more things you could have done in that wash. I'm trying to keep it fast, but notice how I, I just added, it's, it's basically a, a base coat. It's the sky and the, then a, a, a underpainting of other, other colors. So I, I've, I've just indicated some, they'll, they'll show up later and, and they'll be really cool. But I left this white, I left these white, uh, forgot to leave that white, but it's light enough. It'll be okay. Um, so that's wash number one. It's dry. It's got to be dry before you start wash number two or you get all kinds of problems. Wash number two is I'm going to just bring this building down and, and, and bring it on, just bring it all down. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with a, you know, the old building's a, an old uh, tin structure. So I'm, I'm going to just start um, a variegated wash coming down. And I'm going to use, I've got three colors I'm using. I've got burnt sienna and I've got ultramarine and I've got the gray version of all of that. So, so, so I can, and, and, and a thousand different versions of that, either brown or gray or blue or gray, warmer or cooler. Um, so we'll just start with that. And, and I'm going to use a little stronger pigment. It's going to be a little darker because it's lay it's, it's, it's light to dark. So that was my lightest pass. So this is going to be a little darker. So I'm going to still, I'm going to keep that, preserve that. And I'm going to kind of do this fast uh, and not take as much care with it. But, but, uh, but I know that, I know that um, I'm going to leave, leave some white in there, little sparkles. You can see my papers buckled, but I, I'm not going to worry about that. So I'm going to, I can mix those three. I can mix them here or I can mix them here. So, so um, I can throw a little bit of that burnt sienna in there. I can throw a little bit of that ultramarine in there. Well, ultramarine in there. And it'll mix on the page. So I'm just going to bring this, start bringing this down. I'm going to paint around these windows for now. So you, is somebody's asking, is your paper uh, taped to gator board? What's it? Yes, sir. Gator yes, board. Okay. Right. All right. And it'll buckle. It buckles. But I, I just, I just kind of taught, taught myself a long time ago. I'm not going to worry about the buckles. I'm just All not right. going to worry about it. Just let that helps move the paint in different ways. And so. Okay. 
Hello, Sweden. Hello, Albany, New York. Hello, New York City. Uh, hello, Northwest Illinois. I got grief for not mentioning the U.S. So I'm hello, Nashville, Santa Fe. <laughs> uh, now everybody's going to be hopping in and putting their Toronto. Welcome. <laughs> Columbia. I've never seen Columbia on here before. Astralis, welcome. Newport Beach, Cherokee Village, Arkansas, Liverpool, Pennsylvania, Texas. All right, Texas. Southwest Indiana. Glad somebody showed up, Eric. Yeah, about about time somebody did. Albuquerque, Twin Cities, Brookville, Brooklyn, India. Welcome. Southeastern Pennsylvania, Stillwater. All right, I'm going to shut up so Tim can keep talking. No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. If you'll notice, I'm just, I'm just variegating this wash as I go down. I'm, I'm, I'm adding things to it. I, I just want to kind of communicate this, this idea of, um, of tin. And I can blot it back a little bit if I all want right. to. Um, Every painting, as we all know, every painting has a has a severe, ugly stage, and so don't be too judgmental at, at this point. Um, another thing that I want to do is, as while this is wet, I mean, you gotta you gotta be thinking all the time, but I might want to break that edge up a little bit right there. Yeah, uh, I don't want I don't want this to be too perfect. Um, um, I, I can, I can lose an edge here or there. Um, and so I just want to kind of continue this wash on down. All right. A spot right here. What did you use to break that edge? Did you, you, it looks like you used a fan brush. No, it's just, it's just my pointed round. Okay. But I just, uh, I just kind of splayed it out, you know, like that. All just right. kind of. I see. Put what kind of brush is that? It's made by a Skoda. Okay. I love the uh, Skoda's uh, synthetic. It's it's a Perla. Okay. A Skoda Perla. It's a synthetic pointed. It just makes a good point. If you as you can see, I'm I'm painting um, very uh, um, um, with a with a point All right. uh, of that brush. So. This thing that I left white, I can go ahead. There's a shadow that cuts across here and across here. I can go ahead and work that shadow in because I, I, um, because I know that's where it's going to be. Yeah. I can do it down here also, painting or kind of painting around that window. And I know that 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 end of the building is totally in the shade, so I'm going to go ahead and. Welcome, uh, Gdansk, Poland, and Barcelona. I haven't been to Poland, but I've been to Barcelona. Love it. Nova Scotia, thank you. England, uh, hello, Peter. There's Peter in England. Good friend. I Singapore. In, I lived in Nova Scotia was when I was in high school, Eric. Did you? All right. Okay, so if you, you see, I'm just continuing to uh, bring that wash on down. You know, that really looks three-dimensional now. Yeah, and that's just the second wash. It's going to dry a little bit lighter. When I get to the bottom here, if I have any leftover paint, a lot of times I'll just I'll just use a damp brush just to kind of move that along. All right. Hello, Sweden. So you gotta real you gotta remember that um that um each each passage is going to be darker, so so it, it, it's it's getting to the point now where where um, 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 I'm going to start being able to define things a little little bit better. So um, and then and then identify the 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 darks. I, a lot of times I'll go ahead and, and paint those darks so I don't forget about them. There's a window opening there that's dark, but usually, but they'll they'll be darker. All right, we have a question. Um, 
Julia asks, how do you use, do you use special glass, protective glass when you sell a painting frame? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of glass. Um, um, there's always use a UV rated glass, UV protective glass, just to protect the image. Um, and then there's high dollar museum glass, you know, it, which gets very expensive, but I always use a, a good, a good grade of, of uh, UV glass. I'm getting to where it's, uh, I'm painting less on, on paper that needs to be mat matted and framed and I'm painting on mounted panels. Um, a lot of people are doing that. As a matter of fact, I met with one of the manufacturers last week and he told me that mounted panels, watercolor panels are one of the top sellers now. Yeah, I believe it. This is one I make myself just on gator board, glued to gator board. And then I've got one, a little painting I got started here on a Raymar panel. So uh, Raymar is uh, yep. making them mounted to aluminum, which yep. is, is, is really, really helpful. So how are we doing on time, Eric? Uh, uh, we're doing just fine, uh, Tim. Okay. Lisa says, why is it that when plein air painting and in the ugly stage, onlookers show up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely in the ugly stage. But what I'm going to do now is, so, so that was wash number one, the sky and the horizon. Wash number two was coming down with, the, with starting to define the structure. Um, wash number three is just is my darks. I'm going to start just uh, working from the top down, uh, putting in my darks. So, so I've got that sky wash. I've got that wash. Uh, I'm going a little bit darker now for my shadows. I'm going to go ahead and put these shadows in, and it'll it'll start to make more sense. So I'm just using a kind of a dirty version of of that neutral. I add, add a little bit of alizarin to make it kind of purpley, shadowy color, but adding some more of that to make it kind of dirty, kind of a dirty purple, a little bit strong. Um, like that. I don't know if that's going to be strong enough. Yeah. Ultramarine, alizarin, and a little bit of that dirty color. So that's, you can see it's not as wet. It's not as watery. It's, it's stronger. So here we go. Um, I know that there's a shadow being cast right here. I know that this whole side, pardon me if my hand gets in the way, but I know this whole side is shadowed um i ran that a little bit long there sorry about that um this whole end of the structure is in shade this will dry a little bit lighter of course watercolor always does um and then there's a shadow cast by this roof line here isn't that cool how that sort of starts to... Well, it really gives uh, a dimension. Now, I'm going to try something here um, and just to show you a little bit of a technique. While I'm loading this pretty heavy with, with paint here on this edge... And then I'm going to take my little spritzer and just... Just spritz it a little bit. Just, just fuzz that edge out a little bit. Whoa, there it goes. That's, that might that's have been like, a little. I feel like I'm losing control. <laughs> yeah, that might have fuzzed a little too much. But so I, I love. I don't mind that. I don't mind that that doing that. So, I got a little bit out of control there. Now I also know that this shadow continues across this building. And it continues under this eave. And it's it's hard for you to tell, but boy, my hand's shaky this morning. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's Too much coffee. Well, I think it's pressure being on the Eric's program and all that. Oh, come on. You're doing so well. I mean, you have, you're holding a large audience. You don't need to worry about a thing. All right. And, and everybody's going to hit the heart button right now just to let you know there's no reason to be nervous. Everybody loves you. That's good because I have a very 
uh, sensitive um, ego. So, <laughs> okay. You see how that starts to kind of uh, um, starts start, starts to kind of define things. Yeah. And that. Oh, I got one more little shadow line underneath here. And and one concept that we all should know about is 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 connecting darks. And so I like to see this will all be dark, even darker here. Um, when I put my dark darks, this is my, this is not my darkest paint. I'll have one one pass here in a minute where I'll put in all the darks. And I'm I'm nearly there. Let's see if I forgot anything. I'm going to just kind of blot this back a little bit, just to help us dry, so we don't have to stop again and dry. All right. Yeah, I, I we're gonna to... we're gonna wrap up in about three minutes. Three minutes. Let Let's me start. just demonstrate real quickly in three minutes what my darkest dark will look like. So I'm gonna I'm going really strong on this blue. I'm really strong on this transparent red oxide, which I end up with a really thick dark mixture a little bit of water see how dark that is now that's yeah. that's that shadow color that's the that's my dark okay and I, I'll just I'll just demonstrate uh, I'll just demonstrate down here where where my darks will my ends up my darkest darks will be there's a lot of things I'm not doing with this painting in order to get through uh, and demonstrate this but um, I know we're running short on time. These are the darks that are back in the nice, nice, nice. And so there's a whole there's a whole bunch of uh, of calligraphy that will happen. Well, and you'll post uh, the final painting. That way, we can all see it. I will. Yeah. Look how these windows make this up here pop. Maybe we've got some windows that are in here. And and when it's all said and done, these telephone poles will get in there like this. A pretty steady and, hand. And all of those uh all of those highline wires, I've got to be careful because it, I'm 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 becoming known as the highline wire guy, but Love it, love it, love it. These are the la those are those are the last things I kind of threw those in there. Uh, they just matter. So people can see, but uh, why don't you come back on uh, on screen real quickly so we can say goodbye? I'm going to show you this real quick. Oh, okay. That, that, was, oh. that was one I did to, uh, in Dallas to demo, but that's that's you know that's a real quick demo. What when it all comes together, what it kind of look, could look like. Outstanding. Okay. All right. Okay, our guest today is Tim Oliver. Tim is going to come back on screen right now. Going to get a little bit of movement happening here for a second. And well, there he is. Hey. Hey. Well, for a guy with a fragile ego, you sure did a good job. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. I, uh, I always I do feel like, I don't know if you caught my analogy of the third monkey trying to get on Noah's Ark in the rain, but that's what I feel like when I'm doing a demo. <laughs> it's pretty frantic. Oh, very funny. Well, uh, Tim, you're uh, you're going to be teaching at the plein air convention. Yeah, I'm actually going to do this this on you know on a, I think on a full at least a half sheet, maybe full sheet of watercolor. I'm, I'm going to do this same painting. So this is a little teaser for Santa Fe in May. All right, terrific. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you. And uh, you driving out? Yes, sir. I'm about right. four hours from Santa Fe, and my son oh. lives over there, so it's good. Oh yeah, that's not bad at all. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think uh, it looks like this year my my wife and my kids are going to come with me first time ever. So Good. it'll be fun for them and fun for me. Good. Yeah, Good. I won't be able to pay any attention to them because you know it gets a little busy. <laughs> you're a little. You're like that third monkey too, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like fifth, fifth or sixth probably in reality. <laughs>
Well, Tim, <laughs> thank you so much. We've put your website in the comments and uh, everybody give a share and a thumbs up so everybody can see how this is done. Tim, it was fabulous. Thank you so much. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings, or looser, more impressionistic realism, most high-level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend $3,000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention. Or you can learn from the world's finest realist from home for a fraction of the cost. At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community. And learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day, one day atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Batoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egwe, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Chuck Morris, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Mittler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Tony Pro, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, Deborah Hughes, and many more to be announced. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor-in-chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live, from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now 